It's no secret that if you're going to be successful in real estate investing, you have to be able to fund your deals. Whether you're doing the Burr method or whether you're fixing and flipping properties for a profit, you got to be able to get to the closing table with money and you got to have money to rehab the property. And so I personally use backflip capital when I need money to get to the closing table and to rehab my properties. I'm in the middle of a flip right now and I partner with backflip. It has been the smoothest process of all time. I literally went on their app, applied for the loan. You get pre-approved in less than 48 hours. You can lock in funding in just a few seconds with the touch of a button. Funding takes less than two weeks. Hello, that gives you an advantage when you're making offers on properties. And I can't say enough about partnering with Backflip Capital. They're great folks with a fantastic product that everybody listening to this should check out for the next time you go to do a bird deal or fix and flip property. So here's what I want you to do. Go down to the show notes of this show. I've put a link for Backflip Capital in those notes. All you have to do is click the link so that you can download their app and get your next deal funded with Backflip. All right. So I'm here with my buddy, Mark McMahon. Uh, I have been wanting to have Mark on my podcast from the day that I said I was going to have a podcast because he's one of the guys that as soon as I got into the social media game, um, he's like one of the first pages I found on real estate. And so I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I've been taking in your content for a long time, man. Uh, and I am honored to have you on today. Oh, so, you. Uh, and, yeah. and as am I, as am I, uh, you definitely are one of the people I don't, I don't say this lightly cause I don't look up to too many people, but when I see people achieve what you have achieved in a relatively short amount of time and do it smart, not stupid, like maybe hopefully we'll talk about a little later on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm all in a hundred percent on this. It's, you know, I'm, I'm really sounds like a daddy, but I'm real proud to see where you've gone in the last year and a half. It's pretty crazy. Well, I appreciate it. We were just talking offline and I was like, we need to just hit the record button. Cause I think this is going to be some good stuff and we'll dive in all into real estate and all, but you know, we were talking about the different stages of life, you know, mm-hmm. and how you have obviously accumulated a ton of wealth, done amazing things. And you're in this season of life of like, all right, Like, what am I transitioning into to do what I want to do? Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, like, obviously, you know, we're we're all driven. You've been grinding for years, crushing Mm -hmm. it. But now it's kind of like, all right, what what do I deserve to do with my time now? And and then we were talking about kind of where I'm at on the other end of the spectrum where you were, you know, years ago, where it's we were blessed. You had asked me offline when I hit record, you know, kind of like how, how we were able to do what we've done at a young age or, or what was my influences to mm-hmm. be able to, I guess, be smart with money, essentially at mm-hmm. young, such a young age, I'm 31. And, um, you know, I truly, truly can only attribute it to folks who are older than me mm-hmm. and wiser than me, who I've either like, they, I don't want to call them a mentor. They just been in my life mm-hmm. or folks like yourself that I've watched from afar that I'm like, okay, this is what they have done. And this is where they're at. And then I watch other people who are older in life and I've said, okay, this is what they've done. I don't want to be where they're at. (laughs) And so I looked and I said, okay, what decisions have these folks made? And, you know, we'd have not all made good decisions every time. You're going to lose money. You're going to make bad decisions. But we were smart enough. You know, we came out with a lot of debt, my wife and I, when we got out of college. had I had over 60,000. You mind sharing how much debt you guys came out with? Yes, yeah, so well, I had over sixty thousand dollars in student loans when I graduated, and then Don't get I me started on that. Oh gosh, I mean, we could spend a whole episode on. On I will say, I will say, college helped me get the jobs that I got because I'm in medical sales, yeah. and I couldn't. You can't even get an interview without having the degree. Yeah. So mine has paid me back. Not everybody's does. Yes. and so it doesn't. College didn't make me any smarter. All it did was give me a key to unlock an opportunity that I wouldn't have otherwise, but I could have done it for a lot less cheaper, but I went to play baseball. It was a division one school. They gave me the best scholarship and I still came out with 60,000. And then I'm from South Carolina. So it's like, Oh, we got to get a jacked up truck. So then I got a truck and then I got a wedding ring. And then I don't know. I had something else. So at one point, by the time we were 22, uh, 22 going on 23, I had over a hundred thousand dollars in debt. And so for me, what I did for the next five years was just pay off debt from 2013 to 2018 was yeah, literally pay off debt. Just, just the fact that you just said that set you apart. You know, there's a tenth of 
of the entire population in the United States that thinks that way. Mm. And it's really, really rare. Most people would go, okay, I need to make more money. I've got to do this. I, they're not climbing out of debt. They're climbing into more debt, getting a bigger house. And you didn't do that. And that's why you have a big house now. And uh, the payment's not, you don't feel the payment. I mean, I'm assuming mm. you don't feel that payment. No. And mm. most people feel their payment every time they move up to the next one. So no, you made you made good choices. You may have come out of college with a lot of debt, but it suited you just fine. I think you did great. Yeah. No, it worked out for us. It worked out. And then obviously, ultimately, after you know, we pay off the debt, we hopped into the greatest asset of all time, which is real estate. I mean, Bitcoin? Yeah, 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 Bitcoin. Yeah, how'd you know? And Dogecoin. Don't forget Dogecoin. Uh, did you see what happened to Dogecoin? God, just, I mean, this, I don't know when this <laughs> is going to air, but Dogecoin went up like 30% last night. It blew up. I went and looked because, like, back in the day, I'd bought like a hundred dollars of uh -huh. just all the dump stocks. Yeah. Like, and I looked and I was like, "Did I buy Doge?" And I couldn't find it on any of my platforms. I'm like, "Dang it! I could have made a couple hundred bucks." Yeah, woo! <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's hilarious. That yeah, but, but but you know, you were saying that you know you put your money into this 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 wonderful thing, and and that's that's kind of you know. I'm not trying to steer the conversation, but I think it's important to talk about that because most people do that later in life. I started at 46, putting my money. I mean, I bought houses before that and I had a couple of rentals before that, but I didn't do it well. And most people put these things off so long and then they wake up one morning and go, oh my gosh, I got nowhere to go but down from here because I didn't make plans beforehand. And if, if we could just, you and I could just spread that word, you know, live, live a, a, a good life, but don't live a, a, a big life. You know, you don't have to live a big life. The, the things that I've, I've learned in life is, and this is something that hits later on, is it doesn't matter what you own. It's the people you're around and the yeah. ability to spend time with them and do the things that you want to do. And that's it. There is no more to life than that. And people think that, it's all in things, and 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 I know neither one of us speak to the Lamborghini crowd, even though I've got lots of friends that have them, and I love them. I, I don't mind going for rides in them, but I don't see the point <laughs> having one. Uh, yeah. But th those are the things that are important, and I see you know you live in your life that way with your wife, your kids, and doing things, and and that's that's where it's at. That's where it's at. So if you can get to the point with real estate where you can have that lifestyle. And, you know, at my point, you know, grandkids are coming next. At least I think they are. And <laughs> yeah, I wanna, crossed, right? Yeah, well, you know, I got to get the kids on the ball. But um, that's that's what I want to do. I want to spend my time doing that and traveling and, and spending time doing the things that I want to do with fishing and all the things that we do. And real estate's allowing me to do that. It mm. Absolutely is. And later on, we'll kind of get into, if you don't mind, get into my strategy of what, what happens when you get older, yeah. uh, about how you start making changes that, that go that direction. Huh. Did I, did I take a left turn here somewhere? No. Okay. No, that's spot on. I think that's perfect. Cause I think a lot of folks, you know, we'll have listeners of all different stages of life, but I think it's very hard for some folks to be able to look down the road. It's always so short sighted mm -hmm. and there is going to come a day you need to plan for short term, midterm, long term. Yeah. But so many people neglect, well, so many people neglect all three. Yeah. But yeah. people aren't ever planning for, okay, what do I want my life to look like in 25 years? Because it's coming and you don't want to rob your future self now yeah. of things that you could enjoy if you make good choices today. Yeah. And I think that's so important. I, I I can't wait to dive into that with you. I, and I'm curious too, because I, you know, I know lots of folks your age because, you know, obviously I've been doing this for a while and, and I'm friends with a lot of people that people see at, at your age. Do you think it's more important to build wealth early or have all those quote unquote van life experiences and traveling experiences, you know, till you're 30? Um, I'm, I'm curious as to what you think is it is more important, you know, getting those first few properties as a young person or waiting for a while and living your life. I keep doing that air quotes, um, <laughs> living your life on your terms at, at a young age. What, what's what's it, and I don't mean to hijack 
but I just truly love to hear this, this answer from people. Yeah. It's uh, I feel like it's almost a quick trick question because if I could say do both, I would say do both. But if you had to choose one, mm -hmm. you know, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard decision to make. I <laughs> I'll speak from my experience. I took the route of getting a wife, having kids and investing. Mm -hmm. So we didn't do, I didn't spend my twenties just traveling around, you know, not investing, not paying off debt, living life mm -hmm. however I wanted to. I didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm happy with how my life turned out. Mm -hmm. So I have to say, based on my experiences, I would probably go ahead and start investing when you're, when you're younger. Mm -hmm. There's a, a lot of things it's going to do for you. It's going to free you up a lot quicker than you think mm -hmm. to be able to do those things that, you know, you really want to do uh, in the short term. And then the power of compound. I mean, I mean, Mark, we can talk just from age. If you buy your first property or your first stocks or mutual funds, whatever at 25 compared to buying your first ones at 30, mm -hmm. the amount of wealth that you'll build in those five years, just over the long run is, I mean, life changing as you, oh, as you get totally. older. Totally. You know? I mean, look, look what Yuko and I did. Yuko my wife. Mm -hmm. And 15 years of investing, having having no investments to begin with, and, and actually, you know, going into the recession, the big recession, uh, and and losing absolutely everything. You know, we didn't we didn't just lose some stuff; we lost everything, and we had massive debt. Uh, you know, uh, embarrassed to say, but I'm everybody knows that I filed for bankruptcy at that time. And I had always been a biz proud business owner and, and always paid my bills on time. But I found myself in a situation where there was no more construction work for me and uh, things went downhill. But I, I say that to impress upon people the fact that even if you start now, wherever you're at, you know, within people say, you know, I want to do it in a couple of years. It's like, that's not really possible. But, uh, you know, I'd say seven, seven years in, we could have retired, you know, not comfortably, but we could have. Yep. And 10 years in, we could retire somewhat comfortably. Uh, but now 15 years in, you know, we just have to make some moves and we can be done. Will I be? No. But, and that's 15 years. And, and, you know, a lot of times people, especially as you get older, like even at 31, because you've got a wife and kids and a business and, and, and a job. You go to bed Monday night and you wake up Friday morning and you go, what the hell happened to my week, right? <laughs> Good. It, I'm glad I'm not the only one. No, no, it's insane. It's like, seriously, it's Friday? You're, you're looking at your watch? Um, so time goes so fast and people think that, oh, I don't have time to wait 15 years to build wealth. And, you know, because I'm not going to name names, but, you know, so-and-so says I can be, you know, retired and wealthy in two years with real estate. It's not going to happen. Rare, rare occasions, Instagram wealth. Yes, but it's not going to happen. If you, if you want to do this, you just got to buckle in and, and do it. But 15 years goes in the blink of an eye. Yeah. And in 15 years, if you can have established enough wealth to then go out and do whatever you want to do, and you start at 21, what's that, 36? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. That's still yeah. very young. Uh, anyway, uh, no, that's wisdom. I mean, that uh, to all you listeners, this is called wisdom. This isn't even in the realm of advice. This is what you take to heart and say, this is coming from somebody who's been all the way as low as you can get and then built his way back up in a stable way and is in a fantastic position at a great stage of life mm -hmm. and is trying to impart on you guys um, knowledge and wisdom that, that will totally change your life. And one thing I'll add to that mm -hmm. is it is a long, I, I will I agree 100%. It's a long game, like mm -hmm. to really experience like, Hey, I can walk away because I built so much wealth. It takes time. But one thing that will, you will notice is, and it probably won't happen for probably three, four, maybe five years. It just depends on the market and how much mm -hmm. appreciation that, that pay down. But what, what I have learned, cause I'm in the early stages, I started in 2018. So what I'm in my fifth year, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I'm real estate is it has given me a security. So you start building some uh, like these securities into your life where mm -hmm. I didn't have it in 2018, nothing on my net worth at all, worth nothing. Well, then I start buying real estate. I can't walk away from it yet at the time, you know, mm -hmm. but 
Now, oh, I'm worth half a million dollars. Okay, that's nice. Uh, mm-hmm. Now I'm worth a million dollars. Well, now I'm worth $2 million. Well, my cash flow covers most of my living expenses now, you know, or almost, right? That doesn't mean you can retire, right? right? That doesn't mean you can retire, but that means, wow, that's still okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But it's like, whoa, that's a good feeling. And then what happens is that compounding starts to happen a lot faster and a lot faster and a lot faster. And then 10, 15 years down the road, you look back and you're like, whoa, all right. Well, what do we want to do today? We do whatever we want, you know? Yeah, uh, it, and that's I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, five years down the road, maybe because that is very doable. There's a few things that weren't available to me when I was coming up, and one of them was social media existed. You know, there was YouTube and whatnot, but being able to learn what you and I know now in a week. You know, I'm not talking about experience. I'm talking about learning how to do what we do. Um, You can learn pretty much everything you need to know in a week. You know, I teach it. You teach it. You want to fast track it. Great. We'll be glad to do that. Spend our valuable time with you so you can fast track it. Or you can go to YouTube University and probably learn it, too. You just have to put it all together. There's ways to do it. There's ways to do it. But being able to do all of that in, in a short amount of time is amazing. It, it gets you where you want to go so much faster. And I'm not saying it's overnight, but, you know, it's funny. It used to be the allude, uh, you, you would allude to real estate investing as, you know, a 15 or 20 year thing. And I could have done what I've done in five to six year, yours. What, what is a your <laughs> five to six years compared to 15 had I had all the resources available to me that are available to everybody right now. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. The amount of knowledge that is available right now. I mean, just on this podcast, what people are going to walk away with, you know, within an hour of us talking, mm-hmm. um, can can lead to life change. Is the episode going to completely change your life immediately? No, but they can take actionable steps away from a conversation that we're having that can literally lead to their entire family tree changing. And that just wasn't around a while ago. I think it'd be cool, Mark. You know, I know you've sh- shared this on um, Instagram, mm-hmm. but to hear your story leading up to 09 and what mm-hmm. got you to eventually investing into real estate all time. So the yeah. listeners have that backstory, you know, because you started investing at 46, right? Mm-hmm. And full time into real estate. So what is, what's Mark McMahon's life look like up to that point? And then why did you choose? All right, let's go all into real estate. Uh I'll try to keep it as brief as possible, but thank God you can edit. So, <laughs> um, so my wife and I uh, come from a construction background. She's a landscape contractor designer, and that's how we met. And at the time we met, I owned a koi pond store where we built decorative koi ponds for people. I've been a contractor. I grew up in construction and uh, was a general contractor for a lot of years building apartments and houses and commercial buildings and things like that. Had my own company. Did really well. I was I was, I was horribly unorganized and had a lot of had a lot of opportun- wasted opportunities, but still ended up making really good money. We had a nice house. We had you know, the lifted truck, <laughs> the motorcycles, the toy hauler. You know, we had all of that along with the the requisite the, the debt that goes along with that. But we were also making a lot of money between the two of us. And um, when the reset, and so financially secure as far as most of the United States is concerned, they would look at us and go, oh, yeah, they made it. And, uh, you know, our area that we live in is expensive. I mean, I live in a house that's a tenth or probably a fourth the size of yours. And, you know, housing prices here for something like that in a, in an area that's middle of, you know, up maybe middle class, up between middle class, upper middle, like 1.5, 1.6 million. I didn't pay that much, but. Uh, yeah, and still, you're in California. Yeah. Um, and then it all came crashing down. You know, the, the, the banks all crashed, uh, the real estate market crashed. And I found myself without any work, you know, nobody wanted koi ponds. We shut down that company. She wasn't getting any landscape jobs. The one she had canceled. And all of a sudden, you know, we had all this debt 
And uh, we were doing fine making our payments on debt until the income stopped. And slowly we started losing things, cars and self-esteem and uh, pride and everything we had was almost gone. Uh, It was to the point where food was difficult to get. And it was, I wasn't at the point where I was asking people for money yet, but I was right on the edge. And then uh, we found a thing called property preservation, which is where you kind of go in and uh, change out locks, do evictions uh, on on real estate that's owned by the bank, REO Properties. And so I was the guy that would go in and do the lockouts. I'd be the first on the scene. Um, uh, we did evictions. We had to you know get people out of their houses, and then we'd fix them up, and then the bank would sell them. Um, uh, that didn't pay particularly well, and it paid very slow. So we ended up um, moving out of that and still bobbing along the bottom, losing things, finally, finally, finally uh, filing for bankruptcy. And my wife um, is from Japan and she decided she didn't, she couldn't be around anymore for a while. And she had her mom send her a ticket to go back home with our youngest, uh, who was probably six months old at the time. No, two years old at the time. And she left. And I honestly honestly didn't think she was going to come back. It was, Uh it was that bad around here. And I took them to the airport. I came home and I sat on the couch. I remember sitting on the couch. I remember the couch. I remember the the, the color of the carpet when it was carpet. We don't have carpet anymore. Um, And I remember sitting there going, I've been just effing around for too long, not really putting effort into it. I've been going through the motions of putting in applications and this and that. But I mean, I literally have like 20 bucks to my name and I don't know what's going to happen. My house hadn't been foreclosed on yet because back then it would take like three or four years. Mm. And I started calling everybody I knew and I had gotten my real estate license a few years before that. And I ended up calling a uh, title officer I knew, Cappy Pidwell, Uh, shout out to Cappy, God bless her. And I said, Cappy, I'm kind of at my wit's end. And I was telling everybody the same story. I don't know what direction to go right now. I said, yeah, I'm a grown ass man and I've lost everything and I don't know what to do. And she goes, I don't know what to tell you. And I said, I know. I just needed to talk to somebody. And she said, you know what? The investment club for women in Tustin got a meeting tonight. Why don't you come to that and see if anything, you know, if it makes sense to you. And I said, well, it can't make sense. I don't have anything to invest. She said, just come. I said, I does it cost? And she said, yes, it costs 20 bucks. I said, I don't have the money for that. And she said, I'll get you in. I went, sat down next to a guy that was flipping mobile homes. And by the end of the night, two and a half hours later, I, the guy probably hated my guts. I had juiced every bit of information that he had in his brain about flipping mobile homes. And uh, in, in between listening to Bruce Norris, who is a kind of a, a famous investor around our area, talk about how he lost everything in the recession before that. And I'm going, oh my God, I found my tribe. I found my people. And uh, I went out and probably within five to six days, I had gone to maybe a hundred mobile home parks here in the area. And I finally found one that would sell me something. And I I bought a mobile home without a roof and it had been abandoned for a long time for a hundred bucks. And long story short, negotiated with the owner of the mobile home park. He gave me three months free space rent. Um, I had to fake uh, letters of recommendation from other mobile home parks. I went back to the mobile home parks that wouldn't sell me anything. And I got these little old ladies to write letters of recommendation about how wonderful I was and how it was great to work with me. And I ended up flipping that mobile home and made $14,000. And that was my first private money that I ever got. I borrowed $5,000 from my mom. Uh, That was a tough ask. And uh, returned that money, ended up making $14,000 on top of that in a couple of months. And my wife and my, you know, at that point, at that point, I called her and I said, after I got it under contract, I called her and told her I was so excited to her mom and dad's house. I said, look, I bought a mobile home. We're going to flip it. And uh, she, Obviously, wasn't too too excited about that. And, <laughs> yeah, uh, what are you doing? Yeah, I know. And but she flew home, 
And, and she, I guess she could hear the spark in my voice and she came home and she ended up, well, she didn't end up doing it before she came home. I signed her up for a challenge. It was a, I think it was a thousand dollars that we obviously didn't have. I borrowed that from my mom too. And, uh, it was basically a course on how to wholesale. And I thought, man, this is the answer to our prayers. And in the first month, uh, while I was flipping this mobile home and still doing property preservation, um, we ended up getting two houses under contract for the person putting on the course. Uh, and we made $3,000 on each one of those. And that was the beginning. Now, there was a lot of really bad things that happened after that. That was our beginning. Uh, and then we were so excited. We were making money. And then things fell apart again, but we stuck with it. And, uh, you know, some 15 years later, uh, now we're looking at consolidating debt and uh, enjoying life. And uh, it's been an amazing ride. But, and, and I don't, I, I love telling that story, but at the same time, it kind of makes me cringe because there's so many stories out there like that. And I don't want people to think that you have to get to the bottom to do this. You can do it from the bottom, but I don't want people to start there if they don't have to. Um, that's why it's so important to have a source of income while you're doing this. And until, you know, until you absolutely have, you know, five times the income coming in from rentals as your paycheck, don't give up your paycheck. But that's my story in a nutshell. Um, that is powerful, Mark. That is, that's the first time I've heard it, um, okay. like from start to finish. And I know that's going to touch a lot of people listening to that. That's, I that's unbelievable. So. I, I can't imagine, and, and we won't, I won't dig into it for too long. We'll, we'll move on to the good parts of the story. Cause I don't want to, <laughs> you know, pick at all, all the scabs, but it's, um, like, what are you telling yourself in that moment? Because a lot of people, thankfully haven't experienced that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's plenty yeah. who are, yeah. but if they're, if they're, if we got listeners my age, we were, you know, college or younger, you know, we didn't have anything to lose. Yeah. Uh, when all that hit, what, what are you, how do you cope with that? Like, you know what? It, it's, it's hard because you lose, like I said, I, I wasn't joking earlier when I said, you know, you lose all self esteem. You do, you know, if you've, if you've done well financially most of your life and then all of a sudden you're not, um, you do lose your self-esteem and it's, it's a spiral. So, you know, I liken it to digging a hole, right? You're digging a hole with a shovel and you're digging and you're digging and you can't stop digging. Well, if you just throw the shovel out of the damn hole, you can stop digging, but it takes a while to figure out how to throw that shovel out and you, you, you spiral. And, you know, there, there's that saying, you know, when you hit bottom, you'll know it. And, and, and you do know it. And some people pull out of it and some people don't. Um, but I'm telling you, the best feeling you'll ever have in your life is a year after you've pulled, pulled, thrown that shovel out and climbed out of the hole. And you can look back and go, OK, I might not be a wealthy man right now, but my family's eating and I'm paying my bills. And it's, there's, there's no feeling it's, it's not describable to be honest with yeah. you. The, you know, your manhood takes a big hit and, and the longer it goes, the worse it gets until, like I said, until something catastrophic happens. And the catastrophic thing for me was my wife, you know, saying I need a break. And, uh, that absolutely is what, what happened. I mean, that's, um, I was always a very social drinker up until that day, that day she left. Um, and by social, I mean, I had a few every night and I was doing more and more as time went on and people always ask me, well, where'd you get the money? And I said, I don't, didn't matter where I got the money. I got it. And so I was, I was using grocery money for that. And that day I said, you know what? That's enough. So I quit that too that day. And, uh, it was, a, it was a big day for me, uh, staring at the carpet. It's a wonderful mental thing. You just stare at the carpet and go, this is it. <laughs> I got nowhere to go, but down and, uh, uh, or up. Uh, and it's my choice. I can decide today where I want to go. And, uh, and I get a little, it's funny. I still get a little choked up 
thinking about that particular day mm. and um, what it meant to me and that decision that I made. It was just one decision. Yeah. yeah it changed your life. Right. Changed and, your life. Uh, you know, the rest is history. Uh, and, and that, that kind of fortitude that you get from making that decision and doing something positive and moving in that direction was enough to pull me through all the other crap that happened while we were trying to figure out this investing game. You know, we didn't, we didn't have, um, as, as many resources as are available today, as I said earlier. And so we made a lot of stupid mistakes, you know, millions and millions of dollars in mistakes. And I mean, literally a net loss of a million dollars, but millions of dollars in other mistakes by not taking advantage of opportunities and things like that. So I, I can't really tell you what goes through your head at that point, because there's so many things, so, yeah. so many things. Uh, but the one thing I want people to understand is that it doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing today. It is absolutely possible to pull out of it i don't care how bad it is i really don't i mean if there's lots of people that have overcome way more things than me I, I had a financial problem i mean when you get right down to it i had a financial problem uh yeah. you know i wasn't starving to death i still had a roof over my head uh yeah. but to you it seems awful but to other people it's like <laughs> that's nothing i lost both legs and uh you know i live in a box uh, that's awful, right? Yeah. Uh, it's going to take a little bit more to turn that one around, but it's still possible. Yeah. But it's all perspective. I mean, yeah, it, it's all perspective. That's still an amazing story. And, uh, you know, it's, it's touching. It's definitely touching. I hate you had to go through it, but I know that, you know, things like that, um, you know, lead you to where you are today mm -hmm. and you obviously made the best of it. So yeah. you, you bounce back, you know, you have that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're like, all right, Let's turn these, this thing around. What does your real estate business like look like for the next you know, three to four years? Um, well, we were, we started off doing those first few wholesale deals. Then we, a couple of wholesale deals in the mobile home. Which, real quick for everybody who doesn't know what wholesale is. If you listen to this episode, it's where Mark and then we get a property under contract. And then instead of him buying the contract, or buying the property, he would sell that contract mm -hmm. to another investor and he would get what's called an assignment fee. So if, you know, the investor may pay him whatever, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, you know, however much Mark's fee was for that other yeah. investor to buy the contract of that home from Mark. So then that other investor could then go and close on the property. And so they just want to money. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that's an easy explanation. That was a good one. <laughs> Thank you. I don't even uh, do it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so yeah, we flipped a couple of mobile homes, uh, partnered up with somebody and, uh, that didn't go well. Partnerships are tough. Uh, so we lost money on a couple of mobile homes, made money on a couple, uh, started raising private money during that time. And that was, you know, that was kind of unheard of at the time. We, a friend of mine had a short course on raising private money that I took. I guess probably within six months of getting started, you know, after I went to that first meeting, uh, the investment club meeting, and by the way, the investment club for women was half men. I think it just started off with women and then it grew. Uh, I took, uh, Dave Barron's a friend of mine and also someone that we partnered with on a couple of investments and did well. Uh, well, well, we didn't do well on the first one. The second one was what kicked us off. I'll get to that. Um, he started, talking about, he did a thing at the investment club about private money, which like I said, not, not many people had heard of at that point. Yeah. And I went up and talked to him afterwards and I said, I'm interested, Dave. And he goes, yeah, you and everybody else. I know how he feels now. <laughs> and, and I said, I want to learn more. And he says, well, I'm doing a, I'm doing a class on it, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I went and borrowed more money. And uh, by the way, I paid back all, all of that. I think I borrowed a, a total of $7,000 from my mom and I paid it back within, I don't know, 60 days, I guess. Wow. Always pay your investors. Never, yes. never screw your investors. Um, so I took the private money course and learned an awful lot. And I went home and told my wife about it. And she was doing this mom's blog at the time. So for everybody out there, 
this is good stuff right now. It's it's it, this is a good good lesson on private money, and I I think I'm kind of known as the private money guy um, because we've been doing it so long. And so I told her about it, and she goes, oh, I, think, I think I'm going to share that with the moms because they're we're always talking about you know meeting up and doing things and that, and sometimes money comes up, and some of these moms have some money to invest, and I said she's I'm going I'm going to just mention it. And uh, she put it out there on her little blog. And I think like two months later, she was in Japan. And she was doing a presentation in front of like 10 or 12 people that had kind of said that they were interested in real estate. And she just wanted to represent them as a real estate agent uh, over here. They wanted to kind of teach them how to buy property here. And ended up, most of them said, you know what, I, that sounds really, really scary, but I trust you because I've been reading your blog for so long, i.e., guys, get on social media and get some get some social presence uh, like J.D. and I have done. And then we got, that was our first private money. You know, we were able to bring that in. And then we started talking to people here and that started kind of snowballing. And, and, you know, at first we didn't have a lot of credibility other than that blog. And we milked that for all it was worth. And then we started, you know, talking to people here and it just grew and grew and grew. And, you know, you know, some 14 and a half, 15 years later, we've got $10 million at our disposal anytime we want to use it. And not bragging, just saying facts, just laying down facts. Yep. And it's, that's, that was the kind of the next, the, the pivot point for us. It's like, hmm. What can we do with this? And we didn't, we still were scared to buy properties to buy and hold. So all we were doing was flipping. And we got stuck with a house in Compton, California. We had a house that we flipped and we were flipping it with a partner. So every time I refer to something bad, it's typically going to be a partner involved. And so that's why, you know, remember Rick Jarman? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah and my, he was my partner on my show for a year, couple of years before he passed away. His untimely passed away from COVID. Yep. Um, he said a partnership's like a marriage man, get a prenuptial. Always get a prenuptial. And I didn't do that. I didn't know Rick then. And we partnered with a, it was a nonprofit because nonprofits had first look back then on REO properties. And every property back then for sale was an REO property. There was no regular yep. sales. And massive amounts of competition to buy them. So much competition, so much money out there in the market. And so we'd get this first look. We'd, we'd buy it in their name. We did two or three of them. It worked great. And then we bought this one and rehabbed it, put it up for sale, sold it. And we were going through escrow. And escrow says, well, the title holder to this property has an IRS lien in the amount of you know sixty or $70,000 because they weren't paying payroll taxes. And I, I went to my partner and he said, Oh my gosh. And, uh, turns out, yes, that was true. So it took me, and we were the ones that put all the money in all the, we, you know, bought the property with our money and, you know, but had the title in his name. And so we were stuck. We were stuck for a year holding that property, trying to unwind that mess with the IRS. And I finally did. Tenacity won. In the meantime, we rented it out and made massive cash flow. And when we were finally able to sell it, we decided, yeah, we're going to keep it. That was our first rental. Uh, it was a that was a mistaken rental, right? And that that stupid Compton house, which made great cash flow, uh, ended up we we ten thirty one exchanged that into a twelve unit apartment complex that we bought for 600 and now we are selling that for 1.9 million right now. Oh dear. That's just one of them. That's just one of them. So it's a game of time and, uh, you know, ups and downs and learning and just sticking to it. And I think probably the best advice I can give people out there is when, when, when the, um, when, the, when, when I, I have, Awful, awful language. So I'm being very careful today. Oh, well, you um, can let it fly. It's okay. When it, when it, when you know what hits the fan, you've got to keep moving forward in this business. Um, I've stopped a couple of times because I got scared. I've stopped a couple of times because 
I was getting my, you know, what whacked and I, and I, and I couldn't move forward. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop investing right now. I'm just going to take care of these problems. And when they're done, I'll get back on the horse again. And that almost sunk us two times, right? I mm. stop investing and I just concentrate on the problem properties. So, but how much better? I mean, ask yourself this question. How much better off would I have been if I had just kept buying properties and just mowed through those problem properties? Yeah, yeah. just as part of my daily routine. Yeah. I, I would be probably, my wealth would be probably tripled right now. And I'm not regretting the lessons I've learned, but I want other people to learn from them. Keep moving forward every single day. Don't, don't stop to try to fix something. Yeah. Fix something That's and good. keep moving forward. It's very simple. So simple. That's really good. I too, I want to make a note on the property. I mean, that you bought for 600 and it's worth 1.9 now. Unbelievable. Great deal. That's what I call a grand slam. Yeah. Um, and then not every one of your deals is like that, I'm sure. But no, they all are. Buying, no, they, they all they, have, they, Heck they, yeah. They. Well, I need to buy with you then because all mine aren't. <laughs> Every day. One, thing, one thing that I have when I've talked to seasoned investors like yourself, uh -huh. every one of them says the same thing. Now, there's reasons they had to sell. Mm -hmm. So it's all hypotheticals. But when I ask any seasoned investor, what's one of your biggest regrets? They all say each property that I ever sold, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, along the way, because they're like, oh, you know, I flipped I flip this one. I flip that one. I'm like, man, if I ought to hold on to those 50 or a hundred, I'd be good. But they kind of forget that. Oh, I had to flip to live at the time. You yeah, know, it's yeah, like, that's so, you had to do it. True. In <laughs> retrospect, yeah, you, you look back and say, I should have kept on. You couldn't afford to. Right. And, and the thing is, is I'm always teaching people don't sell anything, but I can sell whatever I want to because I'm different. Right. Um, <laughs> But don't sell anything. I don't want people selling things unless they're unless they're upgrading to a better property. Like sometimes you'll buy a property and it's a stinker. And, yeah. you know, maybe somebody else can make something of it. So you sell it and you move that money into another property that, you know, perhaps is a better property. And there's it's, it's OK to upgrade. Um, yeah. But I, I, I don't want people selling properties to live, even though I've sold properties to live. It's there's. There's a lot of things I've done that I wouldn't suggest other people do, but you know, you have assets for a reason and things are going to go topsy turvy sometimes. You know, yeah. I've sold properties before just to put money in the bank and yeah. it is what it is. Business is business. You know, a lot of times, so a lot of times what people will do, what businesses will do is they'll take on more debt when they get into a bad situation. And that's a normal course of business. You know, every business runs into snags supply problems or, you know, their advertising's not working and they haven't quite figured out how to turn the corner and they need more money. And for me, it was always, you know, the ability to be able to sell properties and, and have that money uh, as long yeah. as I'm still buying. So it's one of those things where it's don't necessarily do what I'm doing. You're going to have to probably do what I say for quite a while before you can do what I do. Yeah. But you know, consolidate, you know, and at my age, I told you we we're going to talk about consolidating assets, you know, and now it's time to consolidate assets. I've got, I've got properties that are worth far more sold than they are as cash flowing properties, especially because they're in California. Well, you, you know, know what they say? Nobody's ever going broke taking a profit. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 but it depends on what you do with that profit, though. A lot of people will go and live on it. And I've done that before, too. I mean, I mean I've made all the mistakes. I've done, you know, if there's a textbook on mistakes, there's there's going to be a picture of me in the front because I've made them all. I've made that may be a good guide for you to make. Hey, top 25 mistakes investors. There you go. <laughs> Justin, my video guy, he's, he's like, hey, Mark, let's do the top five mistakes. Yeah, okay. I, those are easy. Well, let me ask you this. How did you, or do you, because I, I think you still flip. Um, if well, I, still tell, I think you still flip properties. If not, you can tell me yeah. I'm wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. How, t tell people, because one of the biggest questions I get is, how do you decide if you're going to flip a property? How do you decide if you're going to keep it as a rental? What does that decision making look like for you? Um, well, we kind of figured it out early on that everything's a wholesale deal, right? So we're our, our, our background is wholesaling. We still have a wholesaling arm. We've got five guys in it that, that they work out of our office, not out of our office. They work in their own office 
and we're basically investors in their in their business. Um, but everything starts out as a wholesale deal. I mean, the way you get your properties, uh, the, the way you, you 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 look at the properties, the way you underwrite them, it's all it's all wholesaling, right? So my my first advice to people is learn how to wholesale because that's where it all starts. And then you can decide what you want to do with it. Do you want to wholesale it? Do you want to buy and hold it? Do you want to flip it? Uh, do you want to JV with somebody on it? You can do whatever you want to with it, but you got to get it first, right? And what so, you mean by that when you're saying looking at it as a wholesale is get it at a good enough deal to where you can make money as a wholesale yes. or make money as a flip yes. or cash flow as a rental. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and a lot of them won't work for every scenario, right? I mean, it just doesn't work that way. That life would be great if it did. Yeah. Uh, but I buy everything based on wholesale principles just because that's the way I learned. And, you know, make lots of offers, uh, throw a lot at the wall, see what sticks, basically, mm -hmm. and see what you can do with it once you get it under contract. You know, that's when you kind of decide, okay, what am I going to do with it now? Uh, and that's why it's always important to circulate among people in your area that are buying and selling because you've got people that want to buy it if you don't want it. Um, but so that that's that's how we go into it. And then. In the beginning, I wanted to flip houses because there was so much on HGTV. And I, I was like, I just want to be that guy. It's a lot harder than it looks. Uh, it but if I can wholesale a house for 30 grand or I'm going to make 50 grand as a flip, I'm going to pick the wholesale route every All single day. day. All day All long. Day. But, you know, in Southern California, I can wholesale something for 20 grand or make 120 grand on just a, you know, a so so flip. We know what Mark's going to do. Yep. And so that's pretty much how I base my decision. What my mental health, what's it worth to take that hit on my mental health by, by doing flips. And I've got someone that runs those for me, but still, I mean, I've got to make the hard decisions, right? Mm -hmm. So flipping became something we did hundreds and hundreds of flips. And, uh, but I lost sight of, I, I did lose sight of the buy and hold for a long time. Because the money was so good in flipping, and I and I see that with wholesalers and flippers. Yep. And that's why I, I've kind of come full circle back to, you know, when I talk to people that are just starting investing, it's like just concentrate on buying holds. Keep your job. Concentrate on buying holds. You'll be so much further ahead. Because uh, if you start making, you know, a million dollars a year flipping houses and wholesaling houses, chances are your lifestyle is going to increase. And you're never going to really, really attain wealth. You're just yeah. That real wealth is built through those buy and hold rentals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we both agree on that. Like, that's yeah. where you look down the road and you're like, oh, I'm in a really good position, you know, because of these properties that I held onto. But yeah. like you've done, you can you can make a lot of money through flipping. You can make yeah. a lot of money through wholesaling. Um, but there's nothing wrong with even doing those as a side gig either. No, you're still, you're no. I, I, it out. You're going to run into properties that you don't want. You know, there's going to be Times where a property comes into your falls in your lap, and it's like this ain't what I want. But yep. Jim does. Jim wants this kind of property. He's always looking for him. So yeah. I'll JV with him. I'll I'll uh, I'll sell it to him as I'll sell a contract to him. I'll, there's a lot of different options on that. You know what we would do if we had some of the house that we wanted fixed up. Mm -hmm. So it's a thirty thousand dollar project. I'd be like, all right, we're going to go flip a house because we just we don't flip a lot. I make a lot of money from my sales job. You have yeah, growing in my career. Okay. So income for me, it's really not going to like change my lifestyle at this stage in my life. So do I want more of it? Of course, but don't want to deal with a headache of flipping all the time and have a flipping business. I just don't want to do it right now. Yeah. Could I do it? Can. But when we need things done, it's like, all right, let's go flip a property and whatever profit we make is what we can spend on this renovation at our house. And so we've done a lot of the things at our properties, our personal homes, off of flips. That way I hadn't had to use right. <laughs> my income. Call me cheap or whatever. Yeah. But that's just yeah, how we yeah, work, yeah. baby. That's just, that's just smart. And, you know, the the subject of, of you bringing up the subject of your job is near and dear to my heart. Because when I started flipping, I really had no job. I had no income. I had no source of grocery money. Back against the wall. And it's absolutely possible to do that. But 
let's talk to the people. I mean, we've already heard about how I did it, right? About, you know, I climbed out of that hole and threw the shovel out and it was glorious and, and it worked and everything, but it was hell. It was no fun to go through that. So the one thing I, I think that, that is, is spoken about too much on, on, on the internet is people quitting their day job to become investors, which I think is the most asinine thing in the world. And I see people doing it that are very successful at it. And it's really rare for that to happen. And to expect that it's going to happen for you is probably not smart. Um, it may happen someday, but it's not going to be like that where you, the people that you see doing it on, on Instagram, that's why they're on Instagram because they did it and it worked. And, you know, so put two and two together, keep your job and invest your money. Uh, if you want to do a flip occasionally, great. Do a wholesale deal. That's great too. I mean, if, if you learn how to wholesale, you can find houses, finding houses, get you rentals. So, you know, do that, but keep that day job so that you can live on that money and build your portfolio, just like you're doing, you know, you're, yeah. you're doing it all right. That's one thing I've always noticed about you is you're doing everything that I wished I would have done. I'm just doing it with a safety net. It, that's how yeah. I describe it. Yeah. Cause I just said, okay, this job is my superpower. Mm -hmm. And I, I would said this in an episode in the past. I, I liken it to, you have a cliff here, a cliff here, and a huge gaping hole in the middle. And the pot of gold's on one cliff, you're on the other, and you got to walk a tightrope to get to that pot of gold. All I have decided to do is hook myself to the tightrope and put a safety net underneath. Oh, I love and, that analogy. Yeah. And it's been amazing. Now, one thing that I have missed out on because of that is I get complacent. And so I don't want to go through the journey you did. So I'm not, no. God, I'm not wishing that on myself, nope. but you were a, call it an animal back into a corner. And when you back an animal into a corner, they're dangerous mm -hmm. and you exploded out mm -hmm. with unbelievable success. I can casually go along my way when it comes to real estate. I don't have to buy properties all the time. I don't have to be on the phones, constantly driving for deals, building out teams. And there's part of me that's like, you know, I, I kind of wish I had to do that because I'd love to see what I'm made of when it comes to that. But I'm not wishing that. No, uh, no, don't. It, no, not at all. That's the funny thing is it sounds so damn romantic. You know, it's like, oh, my God, Mark, you're amazing. <laughs> Guys, you didn't you didn't see the shivering mass of tears that was me on the floor some nights after everybody went to bed. You know, it's nobody wants to go through that crap or someone knocking on your door at one o'clock in the morning demanding the keys to your car. Um, because it's in the garage, because you know someone's out looking for it. You know, nobody wants to go through that humiliation, and your neighbors can hear it, and and everybody knows what's going on. Nobody's stupid. Um, nobody wants to go through any of that. You know, the, that 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 romantic notion of climbing out, you know, conquering the world. That's great, but you know, you don't have to go through that. You don't have to go through it. And and I'm 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 going to tell you one thing too is. That changes you. I am never going to be the same person I was before that happened to me. I was yeah. a different person mentally. Yeah, I'm stronger now, but I lost some humanity along the way too. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, 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 you know, people know me as the guy that's a shoot straight shooter and, and I'm very empathetic with people and, and I'm a super nice guy, but I've also got this, killer instinct thing that, that evolved my wife and I both do now that we didn't have before. And it's not necessarily a good thing. Yeah. Um, so you, you don't want to go through that because it does change your personality. It changes your outlook on life. The way you look at things like, Oh my God, I can see that happening versus that's never going to happen. You know, you, it, it changes a lot of things. So I strongly suggest people don't try to go through that <laughs> for romance yeah. sake. No, that's great advice. And like you said, stay put, do it with security, do it smart, and you, you're going to give yourself a better chance of, of not having to go through those painful things. And, and a segue into that, and you know, we had talked about covering this in this session, is being able to invest and make money in any market. And obviously, both of us know we're in a weird market right now. Oh, yeah. um, real estate's a little more stabilized than probably a lot of people thought it would be um, yeah. who don't dabble a lot in it. But yeah. still, just 
with the press, with banks failing, the market, stock market like this. What is your advice to people just managing it from the mental aspect? And then as far as continuing to find good deals in any market, you know, how do you tell people to do that? Uh, I just tell them, to, I'm, I told you before, buy gold, buy Bitcoin, sell everything. <laughs> do it all. Or just Robert it Kiyosaki, all, buy, buy ammunition. Now, yeah. you know, um, the real estate's always going to be there and it may go down. Look, I, I'm not, I know a lot of big developers around here and they're very bullish on buying, you know, $3 million homes and making them $7 million homes. I was at one yesterday with a friend of mine. And everybody's very, very bullish on that. But I also am realistic enough to know that just because they're bullish doesn't mean they're right. They're bullish because they want it to be true. And a lot of people that give investment advice, you know, one of my favorite things to say is there's a chart for everything. If you think prices are going up, I can show you a chart. If you think prices are going down, I can show you a chart. Uh, it's, it's, it's crazy. But there's only two simple things you need to know about real estate inv investing. Two, two rules, and that's it. Is you need to get a deal. You can't, you can't buy property at market value like so many people are doing and thinking they're lucky that they actually got it, and expecting that to work. You can't do that. You have to go into a deal knowing you're getting a deal. That's number one. Number two is it has to cash flow, and it can't cash flow fifty dollars a month or a hundred dollars a month. Um, even my numbers seem low to me, but we, we have a, a minimum of 350 bucks a door on multi units and 500 bucks a month on a single family. We don't buy single family anymore, but, uh, that's, that's kind of our general rule. And there are deals out there. Um, they're just not easy to find, but you know, it's funny back when the REOs were hitting. So I could look at the MLS right now. I look at my, I live in a city called Costa Mesa. And I look and there's like 50, let's say there's 50 listings in this entire city of 200 and some odd thousand people. And you guys, we've got every, we've got like 25 cities in Orange County and they've all got 200 and some odd thousand people. We got, it's a huge area. And that's all the, that's all, that's all the inventory right now. Well, back in the day, there was like 200, 300, 400 REO properties in the cities. And there was just as much competition to buy those then as there is to buy what is available now. It was just as hard because there was just as many people that were smart enough to realize that now's the time to buy. So you'd go in and make an offer and it would bid up and you know, it was, it was just, as you mean there was competition back in the day? It wasn't just gobble property up. Yeah, no, yeah, no. It's it my thing. Yeah, it's like it was, it was, it was like even back in the in the fifties and sixties, it's like yeah, properties just fell out of the sky. Well, back <laughs> then it was the same thing. You know, I'm, I, I remember driving around with my grandpa years ago, and he this there's, there's a city near us called Newport Beach, and it's it's actually this city right next to mine. So we're Newport Beach adjacent, which means something. Mm. But, uh, but you know, you go there, and the average house there is probably four million dollars now, and it's a big city, and up to you know 120 million somewhere around there. And I remember driving by this piece of property right on the harbor, Newport Harbor, and my grandpa goes, "Yeah, I could have got that for 500 bucks back in uh, 1959," and it's on the corner of PCH and Dover, and it's now a place where people launch their their canoes into the water to, to do paddling and it's prime prime property and it's probably worth i don't know 30 40 million dollars now maybe more i don't know i have no idea it's an acre and maybe 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 100 million i have no idea but it's like back then he made the choice not to buy it because it seemed too expensive oh it seemed like that's not a good that's not a good move right now and case in point also uh, we had a chance to buy a house in a more expensive neighborhood four or five years ago for a million dollars, a million two. That same teardown house now is selling for about 3.5 and fixed up is worth about six to 6.5. It's, it's all relative to where you're at guys. But I do know Anytime. one thing. I do know one thing. Yeah, I don't think things are going to keep appreciating the way they are now. And I don't think we're going to see this kind of growth anytime soon again. But it will go up. 
Because during that time between 1959 at $500 and now at $100 million, uh, there's been massive growth and massive drops. But I do know over time, if you're patient, it will keep going up and you will, you will gain a lot of wealth. So That is great advice. My uh, wife's grandfather bought a piece of land, swamp land, swampy-ish land, uh, orange groves everywhere, dirt roads in central Florida on this lake for a thousand dollars in the fifties. Mm-hmm. That plot, which is still in her family now backs up to the employee entrance of Disney is seated right behind magic kingdom where you can sit out on the boat and watch the fireworks at night and has multi-million dollar homes all around it now and was bought for a thousand dollars in the fifties when nobody Walt Walt hadn't made his way to Central Florida yeah, yet. He's yeah. still in California. Yeah, uh, and it is and now that is an anomaly. Nobody go <laughs> expecting. No, but but, but, but anomalies crazy. happen all the time. They do. That we've got a we've got a property out in the desert, and one of my mistakes, and uh, it's in a place called Joshua Tree, California, and mm-hmm. it's a very very famous uh, Airbnb uh, destination. And we bought this house. It's in the village. It's right in town. And we bought it for 220 and got a, a smoking hot deal on it. And it was a teardown. So we basically tore it down. Uh, had some permitting issues, uh, but we were going to sell it for 600 That's what houses were going for in this area. Now, mind you, back when I was in my a bit older than you, probably my mid 30s, houses in this area were going for $15,000, $20,000. Oh, dear Lord. Yeah. But I was driving around out there, you know, riding motorcycles going, this is insane. I mean, it's great. You know, we could buy 10 acres here. That'd be fine. But it's never going to it's never going to make any money. Right. It's, it's, <laughs> and now it's, it's one of the hottest places in the country. Yeah. For yeah. Well, it was. It was. You now it's kind of come down. Has it? Uh, we've lost. We've lost a lot of value. But Yukon and I decided just to keep it. We like going out there on the weekends now. But the price I just mean Joshua Tree in general, though. I feel like, like it's a hot spot for Airbnbs, though. Like a lot um, of people are traveling. There. Yeah, it is, but it's overdone. So, so that that property yeah. dropped down to about four hundred and twenty thousand dollars in a matter of a month, month and a half. Gotcha. And uh, so, you know, things go up, things go down. But that's another thing to be careful of. If everybody's flocking to an area, it's time to walk away from it. You know, mm. again, I hadn't planned on keeping this. I was, I was taking advantage of the upswing. It was a calculated risk. I knew it. Uh, I have the money to cover those kinds of losses now. Uh, so we, like I said, we just kept it, you know, we yeah. go out there every other weekend now and we enjoy the heck out of it. We'll probably uh, rent it out enough to cover the debt service on it. And that's it. Uh, that's cool. But it's in a good position to be in. But you've got to be really careful with what you do. Uh, but eventually, so even though even though it dropped two hundred thousand dollars in value, it's still up quite a bit from the twenty or thirty thousand dollars that was worth you know twenty years ago. It's, it's insane. It's insane. Wow. So. And that's what real estate does. Mm. Just over time. It does. Over time. If you hold on, you win. Well, Mark, we'll wrap this up. I wanna I wanna finish uh, the segment with you talking about, you know, the shift of where you're taking your investments mm-hmm. in this stage of life. Mm-hmm. Um because you are in you're in a great place now. You mm-hmm. you've done a lot of fantastic things and now you're looking looking at a through a different lens than a lot of us. So what does that look like for you when it comes to consolidating debt and investments and going into this next stage? So we're 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 probably selling off the majority of our. And I probably haven't really mentioned this to anybody, but here we go. <laughs> you um, heard it here first, baby. Oh, no, it's true. It's I haven't I haven't even said it to anybody. Uh, we're selling off the majority of our residential, uh, and we are. Um, I've got a good friend that owns quite a bit of self storage. And I know that's the that's the new thing right now, uh, but there's still ways to make money with that uh, industrial uh, that type of stuff. That's not quite as hands on. You're not dealing with hi Lucy, Lucy's here. Uh, you're not dealing with quite as many issues, tenant issues, and things like that. Now, I don't suggest people do that to begin with, uh, just because. 
I mean, the initial outlay is ridiculous. You know, you're talking a minimum of $3 million for a quality product um, each. But, you know, we've been able to amass quite a lot of uh, 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 money just by holding on to properties for 15 years or 12 years, whatever the case may be. And so now we can easily switch that over. The market is still good to be able to sell. And we're just going to change assets for assets. It's We'll 1031 exchange some of it. Some of it will sell outright. We'll cost segregate the new purchase. And so, uh, you know, we've still got the, uh, for 2023, we've still got the 80% cost segregate. The, you know, we'll be able to accelerate depreciation. Uh, in 2023, we'll be able to do 80% 80, 80 of the value. Last year, it was 100%. Next yeah. year, it goes down to 60. And then it just keeps dropping down to zero. And, and five years or whatever it is, four years. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll take advantage of all those things that are available to us right now. I, I still think that another another uh, uh, technique will come out between now and then. I don't think the government's going to take all that away from us, but uh, who knows? I'm, I'm not going to count on it. Yeah, I don't count on anything from those guys and gals. So, um, And then we'll take some of the money and, and we have, there goes Lucy, we have uh, a couple of things that we want to do. Um, We'll take we'll take some of that money and we'll probably finish the remodel on our house. Um, we'll probably consolidate some debt. We have a we have a second home in Hawaii that's worth a couple million dollars that we don't visit all that often, and uh, uh, we may sell that. We have another one there too. We'll keep the smaller one probably and sell the bigger one. Um, so just buttoning things up to make life more livable. And again, it kind of goes back to the very beginning of our conversation is you have to figure out what it is you like to do and the way you like to spend your time and to do the things that we want to do. It costs money. You know, we like to fly. Well, we don't like to fly and coach. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we visit Japan a lot. That's not cheap. Uh, we, we've been visiting Hawaii more than most people should be allowed to do. And that's not cheap. So we still want to keep those things going. But for the most part, you know, we like hiking. We like, she doesn't like fishing, but we like hiking. We like nature. Uh, we still camp a bit in a, a travel trailer now. We're not in tents anymore, but um, I enjoy backpacking and, and doing all the manly things that s some guys like to do. So it doesn't really cost that much money. So we figured, you know, our monthly we need between thirty and fifty thousand dollars a month coming in to live the lifestyle we want to live. That sounds like a shitload of money, crapload <laughs> of money to a lot of people out there. But you know, if you're in this business long enough, that's not that that's not that outrageous of an amount. Yep. Um, so we're there now, but I want to I want to be there now with less involvement. If that makes mm -hmm. sense. So we're going to shift things over over the next 12 months. We're going to make some moves and get it to the point where um, I'm not as involved in that stuff. And, you know, I, I kind of want to throttle back on the flipping and just at 60, I'm still in great shape. You know, I, I, should still, I can start surfing again if I want to. We'll see if I do. The water's so cold, but uh, just I just want to start enjoying more of the things that I enjoy doing, woodworking and the yard and you know, puttering and doing the things I do. And then of course, you know, running marathons and working out and all that stuff. No, I'm not going to run marathons. Uh, <laughs> no, but I see you getting it in the gym. I think you, well, you do CrossFit or, or something. I do CrossFit every day. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. Same here. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I mean, dude, you've, you've done it. Like you've built it up. You build, you build these things so that you can do what you want. Yes. And, um, the fact that you're there and you're going to transition it into, all right, I've built it. I'm not just getting rid of it. I'm just going to move it into, it's just like a stock, you know, he's moving it, you know, maybe from single stocks into a index fund. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just trying to yeah, yeah. Something that, something that doesn't work. require my involvement all the time. Exactly. Um, you know, and, and maybe something that, that might be a little uh, uh, less ups and downs, a little less emotional. Um, but I, I strongly suggest everybody starts with 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 residential real estate only because you're going to learn so much from it. Uh, there's people out there that that bypass that, but I strongly suggest start off with that first house, start off with that first duplex, that triplex, 
and learn the ropes. Manage it yourself. Um, I've got property management for everything I own now, except maybe one duplex. And uh, the rest of it's all managed by somebody else. And I just, I spend about five to 10 minutes uh, a week going over emails and, and making decisions. You know, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Ouch. Oh, I don't like that. Uh, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I want even less involvement than that. Yeah. Uh, so, man, that's awesome. That is awesome. You, uh, yeah, you're an inspiration, man. You've, you've done a lot. You're a lot farther ahead in your journey and your investment journey than a lot of people are, which gives you a lot of valuable insight. Cause you've seen, you've seen how market cycles change and I appreciate you coming on here and oh, thanks, man. telling your story and yeah. And given all the advice you did, it's going to be so helpful to a lot of people. Where can folks get a hold of you if they want to reach out? And uh, yeah. Uh, Instagram is Mark McMahon, real estate. YouTube's Mark McMahon, real estate. Uh, TikTok is Mark McMahon, real estate. And my website is, I believe Mark McMahon, real estate. Nice. And if you guys want to learn more about, you know, what I have to offer and, uh, cause I do, I do teach people how to find deals and how to fund deals. That's, that's pretty much the basics of investing. And that's what I teach. Um, uh, then, uh, uh, hit me up on Instagram and, uh, and, uh, we'll introduce you to what we do. And, uh, I appreciate you having me on, man. I, it's been a long time coming. I think we were supposed to do this like a year ago. And I think I actually, cause I'm t- that's another thing too, is I'm massively disorganized and same. I don't think so. Not quite on the same level as me. <laughs> um, not even close. Uh, I have to have a team around me all the time. It's, it's, you know, you see those befuddled, uh, uh, politicians a lot of times and it's like, uh, they don't know what's going on. Someone's always whispering it. That's me. Yep. I'm not the guy whispering. I'm the guy listening to who is that guy over there? Who is that? Where am I supposed that to be right funny. now? Uh, yeah, I think you were going to talk to my, my mentorship group or something, but it's a, okay, this is, I'm glad we were able to make this happen, man. This is going to reach a lot of people and touch a lot. Yeah. Of people. And, and I, you know, if, if I can give you a plug, if, if you will allow me to do yeah, that, sure, I'll take it. I okay. am uh, a big fan of JD and I have been for a long time. I've watched him grow from, you know, like one house to where he's at now. And mm-hmm. A, a more humble guy you'll not meet, but the dude is strong and he knows what he's talking about. And he, he's doing things the way I like to see things done. Um, he's building a house of bricks instead of a house of sticks. And it's mm-hmm. going to last forever because he's doing that. So uh, a righteous guy and someone that's worth listening to. Uh, and I do. I, I He pops up on my feet every morning. I'm getting kind of tired of it, but um, just block me. It's fine. Uh, not, not never going to happen. But, but what you tell people is exactly the way I believe it's you're, you're, I mean, we might have nuances that are a little bit different. Uh, but you know, you're, 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 you're doing good work and I appreciate that. I, I, and I don't say that about many people. I really don't. I, I can pick and choose who I talk to. And, uh, thank you, Mark. That means a, a lot, very man. small, very small list. Thank you. That means the world to me. And I appreciate, appreciate the kindness for all you listeners out there. Um, go and share this episode with somebody right now. Uh, this was a powerful episode with tons of wisdom just packed in. Uh, if you didn't take something away from this, it's going to, you know, take you to the next step in your journey. I don't know if you have a pulse. We need to, we need to call <laughs> that one. But, but take this and share it with a couple friends who this could help. Maybe somebody who's going through a hard time and they, you know, feel like, I don't know if I can climb out of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, this is a great story of inspiration. Um, you know, people who want to learn how to flip properties and scale and just what life looks like when you dig all into real estate. Uh, what a fantastic episode. And then take a screenshot of you guys listening to this, whether you're listening to it on your podcast app or whether you're doing watching on YouTube, take a screenshot, share it to your story on Instagram and tag me at Finance Cowboy and tag Mark at Mark McMahon, McMahon Real Estate. And uh, let us know that you listen. We would be uh, tickled pink to know that you took time out of your day to listen to this episode. And we'll both, you know, respond to you personally and tell you Absolutely. thank you. So, Every day. Mark. Thanks, Thanks, bro. This was fantastic. Awesome episode. Thanks for being on and uh, we'll talk soon.